For more quality videos and even more frequent uploads, help my channel reach 600,000 subscribers. With the uh, second pick, the Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb, quarterback to Syracuse University. In 1999, Eagles fans were furious when their team chose Donovan McNabb. This wasn't because of McNabb. The fans just wanted running back Ricky Williams more. The whole city of Philadelphia, including the mayor, made their choice clear, but the front office went in a different direction. McNabb had to walk out in front of thunderous boos and try to enjoy this once in a lifetime moment. He handled it pretty well, but for his family, it was shocking to say the least. Name was called when, you know, for the actual draft. Uh, my mom started crying a little bit. My dad just kind of looked at me because he, he understood my approach and my attitude. Your mom cried because of the booze? Because of the booze. It's, I mean, it's kind of an embarrassing moment for your kid to go through. But what's crazy is, two picks later, a string of events would lead to an even more ridiculous moment. Well, Chris, the uh, Ricky Williams wait is just about over. The Saints have just completed a trade with the Redskins for this pick, and they will take Ricky Williams. Uh, terms of that not known at this time when I was on the phone with the War Room. The celebration was so loud at that point, I was unable to get the details right now. Ricky Williams was widely considered the best college football player the previous season. The dude had one of the greatest college football careers of all time. He was so impactful, Texas just recently renamed their football field after him and Earl Campbell. But with all that being said, what Mike Ditka gave up to get him was astonishing. To move up just seven spots in the draft, they traded every single pick from their 1999 draft and their first and third rounders the following year. It was a trade so ridiculously lopsided, something like this never happened before that and hasn't happened since. The next day, Ricky met the coach who made this inconceivable trade, Mike Ditka, who was also sporting a dreadlock wig. At the time, the football world made a huge deal about Ricky's hairstyle, and Ditko went along with it. To some, this may have been offensive, and to others, it was just silly. But what happened next is truly the icing on the cake. For better or worse, it's easily one of the most ridiculous sports-related magazine covers to ever be published. From the media's perspective, this was treated like a marriage. And for all intents and purposes, it was one. Mike Ditka had put his reputation on the line. He was a coach who was 14 years removed from his one and only Super Bowl. And this move, trading every single draft pick for one player, would make him look like a complete fool if it failed. And then for Ricky, the dude was willing to put on a dress. The media did not take too kindly to this, and if he was a bust, he would never live this down. It was interesting because we were married for better or for worse. I mean, it was a marriage that only last, lasted less than a year, when I got hurt and he got fired, but it, you know, but it was, it was foreshadowing. After the Saints went three and 13, Ditko was fired and never coached in the NFL again. Ricky went on to only last three years in New Orleans before he was traded to Miami. He went on to have one of the more unique career paths in the league that you'll ever see. And it all started with the most infamous draft trade and that magazine cover. Now let's go back to where he first got his fame the University of Texas. Following his dominant career for the Longhorns, the school would have another superstar running back that came a few years later, Cedric Benson. Cedric wasn't on the same level that Ricky was, but the dude was damn good. He currently sits just behind Ricky on the Longhorns all-time rush list. And like Ricky, Cedric was selected in the top five of the NFL draft. In the 2005 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Cedric Benson, running back, Texas. Following being selected, Cedric Benson was seen crying. Sounds obviously an emotional day, happy day for Cedric Benson. You might be thinking that he's crying because he was happy to be drafted, right? Well, that's wrong. He was actually upset and legitimately crying tears of sadness that the Bears had drafted him. According to the Chicago Tribune and other news outlets, Prior to being drafted, Benson's representatives and the Bears were not on the same page when discussing potential contract demands. On a last minute phone call, Benson's representatives tried to make this clear to the Bears front office, but Chicago took him anyway. This eventually led to a 36 day holdout throughout training camp and a contentious relationship from there. This was good foreshadowing for his time in Chicago. It was a disaster that ended after three seasons. 
although Cedric Benson was able to bounce back and find success in Cincinnati later on. Now, we're gonna go back in time. Let's take it to the 1960s. During this era of professional football, it was a much tougher time to evaluate talent coming into the NFL, since there wasn't as much coverage of potential prospects. But the Dallas Cowboys had done an excellent job of finding no-name players from smaller schools. And in 1968, they thought they found a diamond in the rough at Mississippi Valley State. A 6'4 receiver named Dave McDaniels. While watching him perform the 40-yard dash at his school, the Cowboys clocked McDaniels in at a blistering 440. In that day and age, that was as fast as they came. They found that that time was legit too since scouts from other NFL teams got the same time. And when he was still available in the second round, the Cowboys snagged him. Then training camp came around and they retimed him. To the team's dismay, McDaniels clocked in a 4.73, which was significantly slower than before. They were thinking there was no way he could have ran a 4.40. Confused by this, the Cowboys contacted Mississippi Valley State, and they found out that the track that he was timed on was a yard and a half short of a full 40. It was nearly five feet off of the proper distance. Now, if you didn't know, just 0.3 seconds makes a huge difference in a short sprint. From an NFL wide receiver standpoint, that goes from elite to not being fast enough to get on the field. Long story short, Dave McDaniels didn't last long in the NFL, only appearing in four games. Funny enough, he was actually traded from the Cowboys for none other than Mike Ditka back when he was a player. But anyways, let's move on to the 1994 NFL Draft. So I've already brought up one Heisman winner with Ricky Williams. Now in 1993, it was Florida State quarterback Charlie Ward. The dude was a beast. He won the Heisman Trophy by the fourth largest margin, and he led the Seminoles to a national championship victory. As the 1994 draft approached, his mother reported that the family was told he was probably a third to fifth round pick. The thing was, Ward made it very clear he wouldn't even consider playing in the NFL unless he was taken in the first round. That's because he was an even better basketball prospect. After playing both football and basketball in college, he was taken in the first round of the 1994 NBA draft by the New York Knicks. Okay, you wanna talk about all-time athletes? Charlie Ward was not only a first round NBA pick, and a mid-round NFL prospect, he was also drafted twice in the MLB. As for the NFL draft, Ward wasn't selected after he made it clear that he was going to the NBA. But funny enough, the Chiefs had reached out to Ward while he was on the Knicks to be Joe Montana's backup, which he declined. To this day, Charlie Ward is the only Heisman Trophy winner to have played in the NBA. I actually helped make a video about him with Mike Horzemba on his channel if you want to check it out. One year following Ward denying the NFL, another college football prospect opted out of being drafted, but for completely different reasons. So, Eli Herring was a standout offensive lineman for BYU. He stood at a massive 6'8 and 330 pounds. Projected as a first to third round prospect, Herring told the league that he wasn't interested. That's because he was Mormon. He wrote letters to every NFL team, telling them that since games were on Sundays, he couldn't play because it was the Sabbath. Most teams got the point. In fact, 29 of the 30 teams completely understood and didn't waste a draft pick on him. But then the Raiders were on the clock and in the sixth round of the 1995 NFL Draft, they selected him. They offered Herring 500 grand a season for three years to try and sway his opinion, but it didn't work. They even started sending other Mormons to his house, hoping to convince him otherwise. But Herring politely said no and went on to become a teacher for 22 grand a year. So we've covered a Mormon who denied the NFL, a Heisman winner who chose the NBA, a receiver who got drafted for running 38 and a half yards, a running back who cried because he was drafted by the Bears, another running back who put on a dress, and finally, the Syracuse alum who was booed by Eagles fans. To wrap this video up, we are gonna go back to 1999, like Donovan McNabb, Norm Michael was also a standout player for Syracuse, a 6'2 fullback who was a bruiser. So anyways, one day, Norm Michael was casually reading the local newspaper. He was looking through a section that had all the Syracuse alumni that were selected in the NFL draft. While going down the list, Norm Michael saw his own name. 
This came as a shock because he never knew this. No one had ever told him. Just like Donovan McNabb, he was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles. The only problem was he read this newspaper in 1999 and Norm Michael was drafted in 1944. Crazy, right? What happened was the Eagles had drafted him back in 1944, but keep in mind, this was during World War II, so many young men had entered the military. Norm was one of these people. He had been stationed in Alabama, away from where he played college football. So when the Eagles had sent out looking for him, they could never find him. They apparently never received word that he entered the military. It's just wild. Imagine if Norm was a guy like Uncle Rico, talking about back in his day, he could have played in the league if he got his shot. Then comes to find out he actually could have, but he found out 55 years too late. <laughs> 